Hi guys, hi fans across the globe. Uh, I'm Ben. I'm Taylor. And welcome back to the Echo Crew podcast. I'm sure you're as excited as we are to get going again. I've been here for the last week. Taylor has been here for longer. Um, we can introduce each other. Maybe I was told by Harry, my friend who used to work here, but has been left, um, that she was a famous US journalist. Um, and I don't know whether she can validate this or not. Of course. That's me. <laughs> Taylor, how, how would you describe me after a week together? Um, Ben's a classic British boy. You know, we love it. We hate it. And we rock with it. <laughs> no, thank God. Anyway, the format of the podcast is that we have four stories and we'll be reading two each and their experiences that people have had in the film world, which was sent into Reddit. Um, so you'll listen to these and hopefully you, after the podcast, will send in your own and you'll tell us which ones you like, which ones you hate, which ones you just found bizarre. All right, now I'll be starting off with the first story from Underwater Thoughts. We were shooting a gangster short in a parking garage in London. Ben would know that. We had an actor tied to a chair and two heavies pretending to rough him up. Behind a corner, ready to walk into shot, was a 6'6 mountain of a man in work overalls open waist up. Sexy. Covered in grease and holding a chainsaw. We were mid-shoot when all of a sudden, Three police cars loaded up with police fly onto set and rush us, pin three of us to the ground, even more spicy. At which point the actor in the overalls with a chainsaw comes around the corner to see what's happening. Chainsaw still in hand. The policeman shit radios dropped, hats dropped, one falls over in terror. Our runner had tied our filming signs up badly and they'd blown away in the wind. Police were less than happy. Doctor please rush out set after runner fails to tie filming and progress signs. Actor holding chainsaw makes four policemen needs to change uniforms. Now if that's not a spicy story, I don't know what that's it is. You can imagine these guys are sort of just independent cinema creators, not used to this kind of thing and just the police turn up out of nowhere. Not ideal. Mm-hmm. That sounds like my dream. I don't know what you're <laughs> Yeah, about. really, yeah, I I no any wonder. Chainsaw as well. It would have been quite the film. Um so if if you're listening Underwater Thoughts, then uh, please send us the film, send us the link, and we'll watch and maybe post about it. Let's move on to the next. Of course. Uh, as I said, so the first one, the first one's a bit lighthearted. I think some of the ones to follow it might be a little bit uh, more profound, more touching. So listen up. This one is uh, sent in by True Film. And they say that Fish Tank from 2009 is a perfect film. I don't tend towards hyperbolic statements about movies. But Andrew Arnold's 2009 Fish Tank is genuinely at the top of my favourite film list, which surprises people when I talk about it. I'll watch anything Andrea Arnold does. American Honey is close to being as great as this. Katie Jarvis's performance is astounding, not just for a non-professional actor, but for anyone. Her unique charisma makes a character who does terrible things someone we root for. And Michael Fassbender's grooming of her is so interesting to watch because he almost succeeds as grooming the audience in the same way. For the first half of the movie, we admire his attempts to build a relationship with Mia because, like her, we think he's going to serve as a father figure. When suddenly he crosses that boundary, it's shocking at first, but we realize he spent the last hour creeping closer and closer towards it, manipulating both us and the character. Yeah, it's sneaky when that happens. Um, at first, the chained horse seems like an obvious metaphor until Mia finally breaks down after the horse's death and we never get to see the horse being freed, and suddenly the tragedy becomes clear. Mia will never escape the circumstances of her class and birth, and it informs her suddenly violent and twisted actions towards Connor in the following scenes. The dancing scene with Mother is an earned moment of ever so slight warmth, and that's countered by what is, at most, an ending which suggests that although Mia physically escaped, she's only transported her misery to a new location. I'd absolutely recommend this film to everyone on Earth, as I do for this podcast. I mean, I would watch it. Yeah. It's a I, great review. I um, I have seen the majority of the film, and as True Film suggested, it's quite crudy. Um, and Fastlander, he's quite like a uh, charismatic, like, captivating mm. kind of actor. It helps that he's handsome. 
um, does convince the audience that he'd be like a nice guy and then not necessarily. Hate when that happens. Yeah, hate when that happens. What's, what's your favorite Fassbender film? God, how do you even decide? Yeah, so many. For me, it's Inglorious Bastards. Okay. Yeah. I'm leaving that answer ambi- ambiguous. <laughs> yeah, fair ambiguous. enough. Um, I like in Inglorious Bastards the scene where you have Christoph Waltz and him and they're sat opposite each other and you realize that he's a spy from the UK. Mm-hmm. He gets exposed by his weird accent and then the, the telling point is that he says three with his three digits as opposed to with his thumb. Yeah. yeah, it's good. We're going to my very first horrible onset experience. What the fuck? Now to begin, we don't know who this user is, which I guess makes it all the more interesting. Normally, I do AC slash grip, but a friend hooked me up with a well-paid PA gig on a television pilot for a major network that was sh- shooting in a city close to mine. The day went dandy until about the 12 hour mark. Then I witnessed the most unprofessional behavior I've ever seen from the second AD, no less. Three extras had been asked to stay late because the production wanted to use their cars in a scene. I'm sure no one would want to use my 99 Toyota Camry, but <laughs> you never know. It's the character, at least. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. One of the extras became dehydrated. This was stated by the medic, and she vomited several times and almost passed out. She waited around for a bit and regained her composure, and then was peer pressured by a few members of the production into staying. Needless to say, I had an eyebrow raised. Sounds about right. Yeah. I was instructed to drive her car for her during the scene since she said she was still feeling a little ill, but no longer vomiting. On the way to the location for the scene, I asked her if she really wanted to do this. I told her she could back out at any minute and no one would think less of her. I told her after being as sick as she was that she should probably leave. I could tell she was nervous and didn't want to let the big shot TV people down, so she insisted on staying. Once we arrived at the location, she became ill again and was on her knees vomiting outside the car. I gave her a hair tie, tissues, and called the medic on the walkie and asked the medic to come to the location. I was cut off by the second AD and instructed to send her home. I said, she can't drive. She's on her knees vomiting. She needs the medic. Yeah. The second walked over to me and got in my face. Keep in mind, this guy is about 40 plus years older than me. I'm 26. I tried to explain that I didn't know the way back to the base camp because we had followed a caravan over to the location and she was very ill and now covered in puke and needed the medic ASAP. He began to scream at me, then he literally plugged his ears and said, blah, 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 I don't give a flying fuck. She drove herself here, she can drive herself home. Now I'm curious if she's driving an automatic or stick, because that would greatly. So yeah, it's suddenly tougher. (laughs) It's true. I was stunned, fucking stunned. I helped the girl put her vomit covered shoes back in the car, and I again took the driver's seat. We eventually made it back to base camp after a few phone calls to friends on the production crew. The medic took care of her and I apologized to her like crazy on behalf of the way to the second AD acted and assured her that this is not how productions are supposed to be. The medic saw to her and her family came to pick her up because she was far too ill to drive. This is hands down the worst experience I've ever had on set and it's hand down the largest production I've been a part of. Oh, that's interesting. But they don't mention the name. No, I guess not. not so far. Yeah. This was for a major network. Can you believe that shit? You know what's ironic? The second AD is one who gave the safety meeting at the beginning of the day. If I had done what he said, and safety is on the line, made herself drive home, she could have passed out and crashed. If someone's safety is on the line, stand your ground no matter what. Don't be intimidated, you know right from wrong. Even if you're a PA being yelled at by some of his rocker second AD. Never been, not for anyone. I left the production and shook hands with everyone at the end of the night, except for him. He didn't even look my way. I hope that dickhead never gets another gig. I'm thinking seriously about calling that major network and informing them of this dickhead's negligence. But here's where things get hairy. Will they care? Will they believe me? There was witnesses. Will I get blacklisted? I'd appreciate any advice from anyone willing to answer. Ugh, that's a tough one. Yeah, I mean, that's, there's a lot to take in. So the person who's writing it is an AD herself? I believe so, yes. she. Um, but you'd imagine beneath him. Yeah. And she normally does grip. Uh, and then the person who, who was suffering. Mm-hmm. Was yes, she was working as an AD as well. Okay, so there was just like a hierarchy abuse. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, personally, I've, I've only... I've worked in a few film sets in my time. Only as like an extra 
and there's quite an obvious hierarchy between the 80s and once you get to the top they're not necessarily that nice um but personally i've had good experiences i've always found them yes well this sounds more like my junior year prom night rather than a <laughs> film set yeah well throwing up <laughs> too much alcohol exactly yeah. you know driving someone else's car <laughs> with someone throwing up in the back yeah I, I um would never be seen doing that kind of thing that's <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, pretty pretty traumatic. Again, if if you've had similar experiences on this, then that's not. Uh, and we're sorry. That's horrible. Yeah, it's, that's not. You deserve better. They do, you know. Our final story is tied to left in a fantastic situation, and uh, I think that gives an insight as to what it will be talking about. Uh, again, it's uh, an experience that somebody's had on a film set. we have sent in. Yes, I think, and it's quite a long one. Buckle up, firstly. And uh, I'll read half, and then my esteemed cubby read the rest. Just don't bother. I'm bitching and ranting like a lunatic. There's a fine line between bitching, venting, and looking for commiseration amongst peers, so I hope this doesn't come off too much like whinging. I was lucky enough to be selected to a regional festival with my feature. Now, I get how tough it is to get programmed into a festival with any project, let alone with a feature so I'm far from ungrateful. The team and I were beyond excited to be selected and I couldn't wait for the festivities to start. It was supposed to be over a week long plus festival full of screenings and network events, but shortly before opening night, it became obvious to me that everything was falling apart. It started with a phone call where a representative asked me if we planned on attending our screening, which I of course confirmed. They said that we could bring the project on a hard drive, not a DCP, the night we arrived in loop of providing a compressed downloaded file. Cool. Cut to me getting several emails in the weeks leading up, asking me for a download link for the film, highlighted the importance of us providing it. Okay, so I comply, but each time I let them know I'll be there with the drive as discussed, and that I was only providing this version as an emergency option per their request. I feel like I see where this is going. Every few days, I would get the same email with the same request, even though I'd already fulfilled it. Next, there's a phone call about our screening. I get a call and I hear from their rep that you made a feature and you know how hard it is to play a feature at a festival. But despite this fact, they really want to help us to succeed. Then, in a total curveball move, this person asks where and when we'd like to have our screening. It was a multi-venue situation. Honestly, this kind of made me feel special like our film was in a great position where we get to choose. I've never heard of that happening before. I tell them what we like. A couple of days later, they call me to tell me the venues were still up in the air and the theatres aren't keen on participating ever since COVID. I could always rent the venue I wanted and recoup the cost through ticket sales. I say, fuck that shit. I don't agree. Okay. You think you're getting sponsored by this big festival? and you're on your own. Uh, they don't understand my hesitance and ask me how many people I think I can get to show up for our screening. I'm super happy to spend money on social ads, but I explain this isn't my geographical area, nor is it my festival. So I would, perhaps foolishly, assume that this would be something they would be promoting as well. Weeks later, I find out the schedule was posted with smack dab and the midst of the week in a menu that wasn't one I'd expressed we'd want to play. Now, I get it. Now, I know this fest isn't obligated to put us where and when we want, but dude asked and I answered. They held off giving us a schedule for so long that lodging became an issue. The fest is a heavy tourist area that time of year, but just about a week before the kickoff, we're able to find a place to stay for opening night, make the drive and have a good time. I should mention here that one of the reasons we took the trip down was to participate in a couple of networking events that were scheduled for the next day. We didn't find out until that night that the events were canceled. No email, no social po post, nothing. Just a sorry, nothing is happening on the way out the door of the opening night party. Now that just sounds like a nightmare. You're all geared up, you're ready to talk, network yourself, your film, and then and kaput, oh, they're happening. <laughs> Yeah, no idea. <laughs> no idea. All right. Our three-for-one opportunity, three networking events for the cost of our trip, just got shit in its mouth, but we leave feeling hopeful for what was to come from our screening night. Mm. 
All's quiet for a few days, but make the return trip for the screening and Q&A and find an empty parking lot and an empty theater, except for a few people's working the door. My heart sinks as I ascend the stairs to the theater's projection room, where I'm greeted by a guy who looks at my hard drive and says, I don't need that, I've got your movie. I try to explain that he has a subpar compressed version that I'd sent the link for, just as a backup. But as discussed, here's the big uncompressed sexiness. He responds with, it's not compressed, it's an MP4. I try to explain to him, he shrugs and says, it's already in the playlist. Cool. I go back downstairs and wait for the doors to open. Three people show up, two of which are festival employees. One is the filmmaker who's playing after us. I leave, go home, and get very drunk. Yeah, Reasonable. That's a fair reaction. <laughs> Imagine, like, all the blood, sweat, and tears in your film. And, and no, no one shows up. Yeah. Well, there is an email about the awards and that there will be none. In fact, it says that we as filmmakers are all winners. And all we need to do is email them to tell them which award we'd like to win. And they'll make it happen. I don't really have words. This is, um, this is reminiscent of elementary school we're all winners yeah and i was and actually that was a system that benefited me you know what we're all losers <laughs> so. like, yeah but that's not how i remember <laughs> in the coming days i get an email about the big fancy award dinner being downgraded to light fare appetizers and drinks which then a few days later turns into nothing more than a meetup at a cafe i do not attend and all for my two separate trips i spent around 1200 to attend this thing I got zero value, zero of the promised networking with the industry movers and shakers, and zero support for my film. This is the shit that I'm talking about. That is brutal, to be honest. Mm-hmm. We all hustle so hard to get our stuff out there, to find like-minded artists we can com- commiserate with, to pie in the sky, be in a room with investors or distributors or influencers of any kind, and just to share our art with others, and we pay to do it. I'm so tired of these festivals who promise the world, fail miserably, then cry. We're so overwhelmed and understaffed. The world failed miserably. COVID. Hitchcock never won an Oscar. And we're supposed to feel bad for them? You take our money, fuck with our emotions, and fail at every level. And the worst part is that you'll do it again next year. And filmmakers who are desperate for opportunity will continue to pay their submission fee. How does it end? Now that's an interesting question. Hmm. As in, how, how, how can this improve? Yes, and how do these cycles keep happening? Yeah, I mean, I guess also there's so much when, when you're in our position, mm-hmm. coming into the cinema scene, it's all about networking, isn't yeah. it? And you will sell many of your body parts and buy it in a kind of normal way. <laughs> that can be- As opposed to the un- <laughs> Uh So get yourself out there. And sadly, for this person, it didn't work. I will say a big takeaway from that is that Hitchcock never won an Oscar. True. All right, now let's see what happens at the end. Yeah, sorry, go on. Democratization of filmmaking means everyone can make a movie, and it also means that everyone can make a festival. Either you've got a seven or eight digit budget and bankable stars, so you can get into the indie fest like Sundance or XSSW. Or you're like me and have to vie for a spot in one of the 23,144 regional festivals and have shit like this happen. I wish that there were some kind of quality control. I know there can't be. I wish there were. The only thing I can do is leave a negative review on Facebook to hopefully warn other artists away from this particular one. But it doesn't feel like enough. Is that what you'd do? Well, it's funny. I mean, we're, we're here representing our own independent film festival. And okay. I think we can assure our, um, our listeners that that would never happen. Um, and that each film would get the right exposure. Um, it's the hard work that we do. And uh, the boss does. We have to go to lunch. And I think you've all had enough. But good luck to everybody out there. I'm with the British boy, Ben. And I'm with Yank. <laughs> and um, sorry, famous, famous journalist, Taylor. And um, like, comment, subscribe. And let us know what you thought. Ciao. Bye. Stay humble. <laughs> so that was a fabulous story recounted by British boy and, and American young lady, famous journalist, apparently. Um, I, did, I did want to add a footnote to this researcher festivals. That's that's the most important thing. I um, the very first film that I that I had in festivals won a big prize in New York. It was great. Then it was accepted into one in LA. 
I'm old enough to have basically made the film in black and white, but we didn't research it enough. It was just, okay, it's in L.A. We went there. It was in a strip mall in downtown L.A. somewhere, and if anyone knows about downtown L.A., it's not the nicest place to be. So it was a complete disaster, except I met some nice people, and we had some good times, and I took my AD out there. It was one of my best friends, so that was fun. It could have turned into the story that we've just heard, but now you guys have all of the all of the resources in front of you to actually research it. You know, we run two festivals here, and we work very hard on the integrity of the of the festival. Um, we honestly work very, very hard to make sure that you have a great experience because we're very proudly a, a film festival run by filmmakers. But do your research. Submit your films only, only after you've seen really good reports about them. Um, I know what it's like to, to submit like crazy to get your film out there. Um, I've been burnt. These people have obviously been burnt. But research, research, research. Look at all of their socials. A good festival has great socials. They have great commentary. Also, don't just check their things. Do some um, Google searches around them. You know, just find out. Find out some of the people that they mention in there that have been awarded or submitted or have been played in their festival. Reach out to them to find out with it. Because, you know, every every dollar that we save um, in submitting our films, it means we can put more up on the, up on the big screen. So do your research, and there's a horrible story, and I hope that that person um, has gone on to make more films and had better experiences at festivals. Because without festivals, your films don't go anywhere. That's that's the whole thing about it. And we get so excited when you finish your film and you do your master, master, final, 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 export, bang, it's done. But that's only half of the job. The rest of the job is to get people to see your film, and that's fundamentally what film festivals are for. Okay, enjoy. Okay, cut camera.